I, I flew across the ocean here uh, so that I could stand here in my mushroom clothing and tell you all why you should be open sourcing your tools. So that's a high level. Thankfully, this is a very, very simple talk, right? But hopefully it's something that, uh, you know, can I, I can change your mind on by the end of this conversation. Uh, oh, ooh, spicy. One second, we've got a very exciting, there we go. Easy. All right. So uh, what do I love about Houdini, right? And just procedural tools in general, right? Uh, a, uh, for those that might be aware, you know, there is an XKCD for everything. So I didn't come up with this comic, right? But this is the great thing about Houdini, right? Is you come up with some idea, you're like, I want to make a tree, right? You just put a little bit of work in, right? Maybe it takes a little bit of extra effort up top, but then it's just it's automated, right? It doesn't really take any work after you got it uh, working. You know, once you've got that initial HDA setup, it's just, just smooth sailing, right? Well, um, not exactly, right? Uh, but this is what I think is actually really interesting, is that when you start looking at something like procedural work, and, and this kind of happens all across software, right, and all across sort of technology very broadly, you really often come across these problems that are almost more interesting than the original problem itself. And I think Houdini and procedural generation is a really good example. It's like maybe you show up looking to make fire or an explosion or a tree, and then you find so much more than that in this ongoing development. Uh, and now me, uh, full disclosure, right, my background, uh, at least until a couple of years ago, is not from games, you know, I'm, I, I don't even know that I would call myself a tech artist. My background really is in AI, so I have to say that in my experience, the ongoing development, that is the best part. You know, that's, that's what I get into, right, that's what AI is, right, all of it, you know, I, I've, got, I've got some history here, you know, we've got Deep Blue on the left, which was invented because some guy didn't want to learn how to play chess. Uh, then we've got IBM Watson, which was a guy that was really bad at trivia, uh, didn't know how to read the encyclopedia. And then finally, OpenAI, uh, you know, ChatGPT, obviously, because Sam Altman is bad at responding to emails. Um, and, and in kind of pursuing these alternative solutions to uh, tasks that kind of make up most of the day-to-day, -day, right, I think this is where things become really interesting. And this is actually the fundamental idea of procedural generation, right? Like the idea of Houdini is that we've got, you know, these physics simulations, we've got all this nice fancy math and we've got these good data models, right? They all get brought up into this one platform and then we can do a whole bunch of different stuff with it, right? You know, it makes mesh generation easier, makes uh, VFX easier, makes animations easier, right? Because we've got this collective set of tools that we can build on top of, right? Makes sense. Uh, and this is often what it looks like, you know, when you pick up procedural tools for the first time, right? There's some traditional process, you know, let's, let's take that tree, right? Let's take a, a rock, right? You know, I could sculpt that by hand, I could paint it, maybe I could use some other tools, right? Uh, and I have this very, like, linear flat, like, I can make a rock, but if I make two rocks, it's just going to take me twice as long, right? The procedural tools, maybe they take a little bit longer to start up, right? But once you really have them going, once you've got your rock generator, once you've got your tree generator made, you can produce a lot very, very quickly. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously it, it makes a lot of sense. Now, the problem is that in the real world, there is a complication here, very specifically on the time axis, um, and that is the ship date. Uh, and, and now the, the problem is that in, in practice, right, you know, as soon as you cross that threshold, you know, you're kind of building from scratch, right? You know, you put all this time and energy into this procedural system, and if you're building for film, if you're building for video games, then as soon as that procedural system is, is functional and can ship, uh, you ship it. And, you know, maybe, maybe the game's successful, maybe you get to do some ongoing development on it, but usually speaking, uh, that's going to get wrapped up with the IP of the game, and you go on to the next project, and then you do this again, and then do it again, and maybe you get a bit faster at it, right? I think really that is fundamentally what we're trying to do here is we're all trying to get through this process a little bit faster. Um, but this is, uh, this is the fundamental question I want us to focus on, right, is like procedural projects all have this same arc, right? And, and the problem is that not everyone gets that crossover point before the ship date, right? You know, there's a lot of people out there that really want to use procedural tools, but it's too complicated or it's too hard or it takes too long, right? They get stuck in this, this trough of development. And the question that we want to ask is how do we help people move through that faster? And how do we move through that faster ourselves? Um, and here is uh, the ambitious idea that I'm going to pitch to you. Uh, it's not one that I came up with myself, right? It's something that I've got a strong historic example for. And the idea here is that a rising tide floats all boats. Because uh, fundamentally, right, if I were going to stand here and say, like, I'm going to fundamentally change the way that each of you does Houdini development, I'm going to make it easier, that'd be really hard. I mean, side effects is already here. I think they do a pretty good job, right? You know, and I think everyone here is trying to do something to make that 
better, right? Whether that's just like reading a tutorial and giving some comments on a YouTube video, right? Or if it's producing your own content, right? Or putting stuff out on Gumroad for free or paid or whatever it is, even just talking with other people in this room, right? It's all centered around this idea that we want procedural work to be easier. We want it to be better. We want to be better at it. Um, and this only really works if we all come together, right? And that's that's a key thing with open source, uh, you know, and this this is why I have to, you know, kind of get in front of this room. You know, I can't just kind of go off and do this on my own. It really only works if everyone comes together. But I said, this was not my idea, right? It's nice to say, but where did I get it? I mentioned I was an AI guy. So way back in the in the early days, so I'm going all the way back to 2012, which is, you know, eons ago in AI time, right? But AI had exactly the same issue, right? Is this really powerful technology, right? Super hard to use, right? It was the kind of thing where every single AI application was kind of the special snowflake. There was a lot of underlying technology and tools, sure, right? You know, GPUs still existed, right? But it was really, really hard to actually get stuff across the finish line. Uh, and people took a really bold move, uh, which is they became radically open. Um, so this was actually a boycott. And a lot of people in this room may or may not be familiar with the company Elsevier, uh, but they're sort of responsible for the vast majority of scientific journal journals. So for researchers to say we're going to boycott Elsevier is like, it's like McDonald's saying we're going to boycott hamburgers, right? It's like this was the cornerstone of everything that made research what it was. And for thousands of top researchers to go and say, like, we're actually going to just remove ourselves from the top publisher of academic journals, it was like a huge, huge move. Uh, and it's something that accelerated, right? It's something that uh, started, you know, definitely more on the math side, more on the computer science side, and became very explicitly AI-centered with time. There are a lot of unique economic factors that allowed AI to do this in a way that a lot of other academic disciplines couldn't exactly do that. We don't have to get into that right now. But suffice to say, you know, starting in 2012, there was this huge shift that says, we need to be more open. We need to stop publishing the traditional, like, closed formats, right? And, and it, that, that was actually, a, a, to be clear, the thing that they were rejecting Elsevier for was archive, was we're just going to give our research away for free. Because the big thing is when you publish with a scientific journal, they then own your article and they can't, you can't just give it away to people for free anymore, even if it's, you know, taxpayer funded research. Uh, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no mathematician here, right? But uh, that's a pretty convincing chart. Right? I just want people to, to take a moment to look at this. So this is NeurIPS, which is the biggest AI conference uh, basically in existence. Right, And here you'll see from 2016, so even getting, getting a little earlier from that, right, through 2021, but it's a really important moment in time. And this is a, that, that highlighted uh, point in orange, actually, that was right around when the, the nature boycott, sort of the second really big wave of boycotts happened. Um, and what happened was that the uh, machine learning community, really broadly, looked at their papers. And you can see here this rate, this 49% in 2018, right? That is the percentage of papers that are being published with source code. And like, for people from academia, like, to just take a beat for that, right? In 2018, right, already half of the papers, because of this big push back in 2012, were being released with source code. For most disciplines, that number is going to be like, 10% maybe, probably less, right? So the fact that it was already at 50% was amazing. But it was at 50%, and then this boycott happened, and then the AI community said, you know what? That's not good enough. And then they started surging, right? And not only did it start becoming more and more popular to open source, right? You see the majority. There, there's some that, you know, couldn't be open source for various, like, practical reasons. So there was kind of, like, a limit to that. But you see this surge in submissions, right? What you see is that, like, as the community gets more open, Right, as there is a stronger and stronger pushback against this idea that research and work should be owned by individuals, there is a much broader prolif proliferation of work really broadly in the space. Uh, it, oh, yeah, that's uh, obviously very relevant to the conversation. Um, Right. But, you know, obviously, uh, there's more data than just this, right? So that's that's NeurIPS, which is a really good piece of data, but also basically every major AI framework you've ever heard of or used, if you've played around with, it's all open source, right? It is so ubiquitous that you can't build anything in AI without building fundamentally on top of open source technology. And none of this stuff, none of it existed back in 2012. Not a single line of code of any of these tools. Uh, and again, the fundamental question, did it work? I mean, I showed you NeurIPS, right? Uh, you know, that's one conference. But no, look at this. 2012. There's a clear, clear sea change, 
right? I mean, and we see it just keeps accelerating, right? We have kind of the bottom, the bottom chart picks up where the top one leaves off. And here's what's really important to realize, right? Is this is not like, you know, this was not an early field. Like these conferences have been around for decades. You can see like how long was that plateau, right? This, this uh, original AI winter back in the 80s. So here we have a field that is decades old. You know, it's older than that even, right? That's just kind of the modern history of it, right? That decided very specifically, we are going to go open, right? We're going to go open source. We're going to publish all our research, right? We're going to share code as actively and, you know, aggressively as we possibly can. And it worked. It worked really, really well. Uh, you know, AI kind of went from this like weird thing off on the side, right? To something that is kind of, you know, everyone's heard about it now. Uh, now, okay. I'm going to take a, a breath here because there's a really important distinction that we've got to make. Uh, some people might not really appreciate this uh, because there's a lot of free art out there, right? If you go on Gumroad, right? I mean, if you go on ArtStation, right? There's a lot of stuff that's free. Uh, free is very importantly different from open source, right? These things are, are not really uh, comparable in a lot of ways. There was a lot of free AI stuff before, right? But the thing that's really key about making your work open source is that there are clear rules for reuse, right? It means someone can actually take your code, they can modify it, right? They can put it back up, right? That's not something that someone can do if you just give it away for free, all right? And, a lot, and what people don't realize, really broadly speaking, is just because your intent when you give something away for free is for people to use it really broadly, that doesn't mean that that is what is reflected in the law. Really, really importantly, if you don't have a license, you can't use it. So this is the default assumption of the law, actually. A lot of people don't realize this. If I put something up for free, right? And I say, hey, this is free, right? And I even say, hey, everyone use this. I want you to use this, right? If I don't have a license on that, that specifically says, here's how you're allowed to use it, here's how you're not, then the default assumption under the law internationally is you're not allowed to use it, even if you're giving it away for free. Uh, and I've seen tech artists that literally have been giving work away for years, uh, and they just don't have a license on the repo, right? So that's that's just really important. Uh, this next slide has basically all of the text. Uh, this is something if you want to open source your stuff, just take a picture of this slide. Um, the really high level is that there are different licenses, right? There are meaningful differences between these different kinds of licenses, and it is important to pick the one that is right for you. Um, at a really high level, um, this upper left-hand corner, MIT, BSD, Apache, anything in that lane, there's probably going to be the right choice. For 90 plus percent of everyone, like that is the right choice uh, for what you're doing. That is, that's what you're trying to do when you give something away for free. It's just like, hey, look, you're allowed to use it. If it breaks, don't come back to me and complain, right? That's really all these, all these, uh, all these say. Um, I won't get too far into the other left-hand side, but I do want to make a specific note about uh, Creative Commons. Um, CC0, great, you know, like that's public domain and that kind of opens things up really broadly. But Creative Commons, really broadly speaking, is a license that is made for art, not technology. Um, if you're interested, we can talk about it a little bit more nuanced later. But for things like reuse and modification, actually Creative Commons has a lot of like, it, it's not even that you're allowed to do those or not allowed to do those under Creative Commons. It's just like it was not conceived with that in mind. And so there's a lot of indeterminate stuff with Creative Commons. And so if you're giving HDAs away and whatnot, I really strongly recommend do not do it under Creative Commons. Um, textures are like art, you know, Creative Commons is a good fit for it. And really importantly, saying this is free in the README does not allow anybody to use it. Uh, really, really important. Uh, that is actually like the most common license right now in the market today is just saying this is free and that does not actually allow people to use it. Okay. All right. Now the big tough stuff, how do I get paid? Right? So I think this is the thing that's tough, right? You know, I've got a company and here I'm fundamentally telling you to give your stuff away for free, right? Like where do I get off? Um, and I think a lot of the reason that people have this immediate reaction is because we tend to think about things like this, right? There's, you know, you're an employee, you're a contractor, you're some, some third party, uh, you know, asset provider, and you give code and you give art to this person and they pay you money. Uh, and so obviously then if there's more code, if there's more art, if more of this stuff is open source and there's more people competing for you, right? And they're paying, you know, different amounts to these different people and you only get, you know, your $1 sign instead of three. It's a really reasonable way to think about it. And if you're thinking about selling like widgets or, you know, potatoes or something like that, right? This is exactly how it works. So it's a very like intuitive mentality. Um, but in practice, and again, you know, I'm a very data-driven person, so that's what I'm going to point at. This is not 
usually how it how it works in a, in a lot of these kind of developing markets. Um, this is relevant, obviously. Um, people realize like tech art is in like very, very high demand, right? And continues to be, and things have been getting more open, not less. I think people can at least recognize that things are more open now than they were three years ago. Um, and this is kind of the reason why, right? It, like it doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it under the other, uh, un, uh, under the other mentality, if the tools are staying the same, you know, why would the salaries rise over time? Uh, and the reason is this fundamentally, is because what's happening actually is like the the employee, you know, the the customer rather, you know, a game studio in this case, right? They are giving money to you know the employee to the contractor to you, right? But they're not exactly paying for the code and art, right? You know, the reason that they bring on you know a contractor or hire an employee is not because you can produce a certain number of widgets in in broad terms, right? Um, Instead, the way to think about it is like they're hiring you because you bring a certain level of quality, because you've got expertise, right? Because you know actually how to assemble things and deliver things for this particular context, whatever it is. And so if you can deliver more of that, right? If you've got more tools that just allow you to bring more code and more art back into environment, then you get paid more. Whether that code is open source or not, whether you wrote the original code or whether you modified it. Right. And so the idea really broadly is if everyone is providing more code and more art is more productive broadly, then everybody gets paid more. Even if, you know, you are giving a piece of your art away for free. The idea is you're also using art that other people are giving away for free. And hence the uh, rising tide floats all boats. Uh, now, uh, this would not really be a compelling conversation if I were just telling you to do this without doing this myself. Uh, so a lot of people might realize, uh, you know, I think some people have heard that Mythica, we developed a way of actually hosting and sharing your Mythica models over the web. Uh, so you can see here, and uh, if people are sufficiently ambitious, I am going to try to demo this live. Um, yeah, and so you can see here, we've got a 3D scene with a cactus. This is a, an HDA that we just put together as a demo. There's a couple of others here. Uh, and, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not trying to say that it's a super, super fancy HDA or anything. But you can see it changed, right? You know, I update the height, right? You know, and I actually see this update live. Importantly, in the browser. I don't know if you can see that link, api.mythica.gg slash demo, but I promise if everybody goes to that link, this will break live in front of everyone. Um, uh, but but this is this is the idea at a really high level, right? You know, you upload your HDA, you get a you know parameter made of it. You don't need a Houdini license to run this, obviously, because it's on the web. Uh, and uh, we open sourced it. Uh, as of this, you know, about an hour ago, we took all the code needed for this. We took the, the source code, we took the client, we took the new protocols actually to do uh, super low latency communication to remote Houdini instances, and it is all up on GitHub for your pleasure. So uh, check it out, uh, and hopefully by doing all of that, I've convinced you that open sourcing is a good idea, not just for us, but for all of you. Um, let me know if you have any questions.